Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to It's Evil. I'm Mio Shabin, your host. This radio series tells genuine crime stories involving real individuals, simply things that we cannot explain. I usually say the creepiest crimes happen in small towns. Who knows, maybe it's because there's so many hidden secrets. In this season, we have 10 real terrifying episodes. Before we begin, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Gore Culture, your go-to source for newest horror movies, thrillers, sci-fi, and more. And my production company, MVP Films Productions, for making this episode possible. Welcome to It's Evil, Real Atlanta Cases. The most infamous crime in 19th century Georgia occurred in Bibb County, about 12 miles west of Macon, in the early morning hours of August 6, 1887, when Tom Woolfolk pronounced Woolfolk, murdered nine members of his family with an axe. Woolfolk was born on June 1860 in Bibb County to Susan Moore and Richard F. Woolfolk in the farmhouse on his father's large cotton plantation, the same house where their murders occurred 27 years later. His mother, who was from Athens in Clark County, married Richard Woolfolk in 1854, the year he graduated from the University of Georgia. Tom was the third child and only son of his parents. Shortly after his birth, Tom's mother died, and he and his sisters were sent to live with a maternal aunt in Athens. Tom's father, a businessman and landowner, remarried in 1867, and shortly thereafter, Tom moved back to Bibb County to live with his father and new stepmother, Maddie Howard, at his father's farmhouse. Tom Woolfolk was quarrelsome, and those who knew him thought he was a sharp, cunning, dissipated, unscrupulous fellow, and a very perverse, obstinate, eccentric, and I. Georgia Bird, a young woman who married Woolfolk but left him within three weeks and later divorced him, said that he is not crazy. He is the meanest man I ever saw. There is nothing too mean for him to do. Woolfolk hated his stepmother and strongly disliked the six children born as a result of his father's remarriage. His ill will toward his father's new family is heightened, heightened by the belief that they stood in the way of his inheriting his father's properties. On Saturday, August 6, 1887, nine members of the Woolfolk family were brutally murdered with an axe. Tom's father, 54. Tom's stepmother, 41. Their six children, Richard Jr., 20. Pearl, 17. Temperance West, 84. An aunt of Mrs. Woolfolk. The only inhabitant of the farmhouse not slain was Tom Woolfolk who before daybreak sought help from neighbors, claiming that his father's family had been murdered and that he had escaped death only by jumping out a window. Woolfolk then returned to the house before anyone else got there. He later claimed that he moved from room to room to confirm that Everett's dead, and that he heard the unknown killers exit the back way, slamming the fence gate behind them. He then washed himself and flung his blood-stained clothing down a well. Within hours, several thousand people had rushed to the Woolfolk home and a coroner's inquest was held on the spot. Suspicion immediately focused on Wolf. He had specks of blood in his ears. There was a bloody handprint on his leg. He behaved oddly, showing no emotion about the tragedy and appearing more apprehensive than grief-stricken, and his explanation of why he alone had survived seemed unlikely. There was no evidence of forced entry or theft. The coroner's jury therefore concluded that Woolfolk was the murderer. But even before the verdict was rendered, the sheriff had quietly conveyed Woolfolk to jail to prevent the angry crowd from lynching him. The murders electrified Georgia and the nation and were the subject of immense newspaper coverage, including an article that appeared on the front page of the New York Times the day after the slayings. Much of the press coverage was sensationalistic. The Greensboro Herald and Journal called the crime more bloody, more fiendish and exhibiting a deeper depravity than any crime ever committed in the state. The press nicknamed Tom Bloody Woolfolk, and the case was the most publicized criminal proceeding in Georgia's history. Woolfolk was indicted on counts of murder, but tried only for the murder of his father. A trial began in the Superior Court of Bibb County on December 5, 1887. After only 12 minutes of deliberation, the jury convicted him on December 15, and the same day he was sentenced to death. On February 11, 1889, however, the Supreme Court of Georgia granted Woolfolk a new trial 
because the trial court had permitted the introduction of damaging but inadmissible testimony, and also because it had done nothing when during closing arguments courtroom spectators referring to Woolfolk had shouted, hang him. Hang him. After the Supreme Court decision, Woolfolk was granted a change of venue. The retrial began on June 3, 1889 in Perry, Court of Houston County. On June 24, after deliberating for 45 minutes, the jury convicted Woolfolk, who was sentenced to death the following morning at his retrial, as at his first trial. Woolfolk made an unsworn statement to the jury denying guilt. At both trials, however, the evidence of Woolfolk's guilt was overwhelming. Tom Woolfolk lies buried near one of his sisters at Orange Hill Cemetery in Hawkinsville in Pulaski County. His tombstone is almost illegible and was recently repaired after being vandalized. His nine victims are buried in two rows the graves topped by red brick overlays in the family plot at Rose Hill Cemetery in Macon. The individual graves were originally unmarked. Sometime after March 2005, headstones were placed on each grave. A marble step leading to the grave site contains the name Wolf Oak. Story number two. Eight people, including six Asian women, are dead following a series of shootings at three massage parlors in the Atlanta area Tuesday evening. The shootings are the latest acts of violence against Asian people living in the U.S., which have risen significantly in the past year in large part due to racist rhetoric. While authorities have yet to determine a motive in this latest attack, the fact remains that six Asian people are dead as a result, and this compounds fears the community faces on a daily basis, advocates say. The group Stop AIP Hate has recorded three 795 hate incidents against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, with women victimized at more than twice the rate of men. This latest attack will only exacerbate the fear and pain that the Asian American community continues to endure, Stop AAP8 said in a statement. The first shooting occurred Tuesday evening at Young's Asian Massage Parlor in Ancorth, about 30 miles north of Anta. Five people were shot, four of whom died. Atlanta police responded to a robbery about an hour later at Gold Spa in Northeast Atlanta, where they found three women dead from apparent gunshot wounds, according to a statement. After hearing shots fired from another business across the street, they found another woman shot dead inside of aromatherapy spa. Robert Aaron Long, a 21-year-old Georgia resident who is white, was arrested in connection with the shootings and charged with eight counts of murder and one count of aggravated assault. Cherokee County Sheriff Frank Reynolds said his office was able to identify long from surveillance video footage of the shooting in Acorth and put a call out on social media. Long's parents contacted the office to say they believed the suspect to be their son. He said, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lansbottom said that while this has not been officially categorized as a hate crime, the uptick in violence toward Asian Americans is an issue that's been happening across the country, adding, it is unacceptable, it is hateful, and it has to stop. The mass shooting of six Asian women at their place of work and two other white victims is reverberating around the country. The full motive behind the attacks is still unclear. We are very early in this investigation. Even though we've made an arrest, uh, there's still a lot more work to be done. 21-year-old Robert Aaron Long, now in custody and charged with murder and assault, has admitted to the shootings. Officials in Georgia who are investigating the case with the help of the FBI said he frequently visited massage parlors in the past and denied his attacks were racially motivated. He does claim that it was not racially motivated. He apparently has an issue, uh, what he considers a, a, a sex fiction, and sees these locations as something to go to these places and, and it's a temptation for him that he wanted to eliminate. A crime against any community is a crime against us all, Bottom said. What we know about the victims. The Cherokee County Sheriff's Office released the names of the four victims who died in a shooting at Young's Asian Massage. They are Delana Ashley Yan, 33, Paul Andre Mehickles, 54, Zia Tien, 49, and Dao Yu Feng, 44. One additional victim, LCSR Hernandez Ortiz. The Atlanta Police Department on Friday released the names of the four additional victims who died through a statement by the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office. They are soon C. 
Park, 74, Kyan J. Grant, 51. South Korea's foreign ministry said its diplomats in Atha have confirmed with police that four of the victims who died were women of Korean descent, according to the Associated Press. Authorities did not give many details of the victims in the news conference. Wednesday morning, other than to say that two were white and six were Asian, Cherokee County Sheriff spokesperson Jay Baker said Tuesday was a really bad day. Framing that drew criticism from many on social media who said this diminished the tragedy of the eight people who were killed. Activist Shannon Watts, the founder of Moms Demand Action, a gun control advocacy group, contrasted this statement by Baker with the description of the female victims as a temptation longed to eliminate. This is misogyny, she wrote on Twitter. What we know about the suspect. Authorities said that Long, who lives in Woodstock, Georgia, told police that he has a sex addiction. They said he claimed that the killings were not racially motivated, drawing outrage across the country from Asian Americans and others who said racism has historically been deeply rooted in the sexualization of Asian women. In addition to describing the massage parlors as a temptation that Long wanted to eliminate, Baker also said the suspect made a comment indicating that he had plans to head to Florida as part of a plot to attack some type of porn industry. Despite what Long told police, Racism has not been eliminated as a motive in the shootings. Sheriff Reynolds said, They are still very early in this investigation, which is now being conducted with assistance from the FBI. Georgia State Rep. Bing Guayan, the state's first Vietnamese American representative, said the shootings appear to be at the intersection of gender-based violence, misogyny, and xenophobia, according to the app. To some, Long's explanation to the police pointed to a troubling, long-standing history of fetishism, sexualization, and stereotyping directed toward Asian women in particular. Of course, he targeted these women because they were Asian. Asian women end up in massage parlors, to which non-Asian men are attracted. Writer Viet the Nunghain told the pub as Nusher's national correspondent about anti-Asian discrimination. It's a whole environment of targeting Asian women first as sexual objects of desire and then as objects of racial fear and hatred. Other Asian Americans challenged the idea that sex addiction could rule out the possibility that racism was also at play, including Lily Tran, the chief product officer at the Texas Tribune. As if these things aren't related and based on centuries of sexualized and submissive stereotypes of Asian women, she tweeted. White supremacy is rooted in misogyny and racism. What we know about violence toward Asians across the country. Tuesday shootings were a grim reminder that Asians in the U.S. continue to be discriminated against. And this targeting has grown worse amid the coronavirus pandemic. Stop Aapi Hate reported more than 1,000 hate incidents in the two weeks after the virus began spreading across the U.S. and thousands more since then. Communities continue to be rattled by these attacks. The number of documented hate crimes only capture a fraction of the racism the Asian community faces on a daily basis. It doesn't include actions like verbal harassment, refusal of service, or vandalism, which may not be reported as these are often harder for law enforcement to pursue. Should the authorities find enough evidence to prove that the murders were racially motivated, they could prosecute the case as a hate crime. This happened with several shootings where the killer made clear their intentions were driven by hate of a group of people, including the attacks carried out by Dylan Roof, who wrote a racist manifesto before killing nine black parishioners at Emmanuel AMM yeah. Church in Charleston, SCC. The Atlanta chapter of Asian Americans Advancing Justice said in a statement, while the details of the shootings are still emerging, the broader context cannot be ignored. The shootings happened under the trauma of increasing violence against Asian Americans nationwide, fueled by white supremacy and systemic racism. Story number three. It was late into a foggy Tuesday night in 1987 when the house on 1114 Fountain Drive in Atlanta, Georgia, began to bleed. One moment all appeared as expected in this modest, quiet home. Then crimson fluid oozed down the white walls, seeped through the wooden hallway floors, 
splattered across the living room carpet and found its way into almost every crack and crevice of the six-room brick residence. Minnie Winston, 77, with a thicket of gray speckled hair, was soaking in the bathtub, a place to unwind and escape the stressors of caring for her husband. Her shoulders looked frail and bird-like, but they could carry more weight than her slight frame suggested. Life did not give Minnie much time for herself. Whatever turmoil existed in the outside world was just that now. Outside, the house was locked and the alarm activated for the night, their sanctum holding only the two empty nesters. Minnie got out of the tub. As she walked, she stepped into a red puddle. It appeared to bubble up through the tile floor right at her feet. She was confused. I didn't get scared, she later recalled, because I didn't know where it was coming from. Then fear invaded. It looked like blood. The retiree was in ill health and frail, perpetually tethered to his bed by old age. She ran out of the bathroom and into the hallway, calling Willie's name, searching for any sign of what was awry. When she got in the hall, she froze. The red liquid was everywhere, along the baseboard and smeared across the walls. Dimey silver dollar stars blitz splattered everywhere around her. That's when a geyser of blood shot through the wooden floor projecting out as though the home had nicked an invisible artery for their spreading and painting the hallway wreck. She made it to Willie's room. She shook him awake. Come look at all of this red stuff coming out of the floor. By the time Willie got out there, puddles had settled like a still red lake. As husband and wife stood gazing in, in astonishment, so began the case of a house of blood that remains unparalleled in both police and parapsychology files a fault line between a family's tranquility and the perpetual violence of a world torn apart. Brenda Dipple, 28, had come to Atlanta from out west, where the Texas native had studied community health at New Mexico State before switching her focus to police science. Her father had been a daredevil paramedic with a rescue crew in Texas, helping wayward souls stranded on mountains and hiking trails. Despite her relative youth, Brendan now had a chance to help people in another way as a lab technician on the Atlanta Police Department's Major Cases Squad. Her role may not have been glamorous, but she could help find justice for victims who had been deprived of their voices. Most cases for Brenda and her fellow lab techs were routine, and many were grim. As a blood tech, her energy was channeled in careful observation and collection of samples, cultivating an eye for droplets and patterns that might be missed by the most experienced detectives. But this day in September brought something far stranger. In the middle of the night, the late shift homicide squad had been celebrating an officer's birthday with cake. Downtime was not typical for the AP of the year. The city had seen a spike in murder, a result of the flourishing drug trade and growing poverty that nearly tripled from the year before. A telephone cut into the office chatter. When the detective closest to the phone answered, confusion clouded his face blood coming down walls. But there's no body. The detective on the phone briefed his colleagues. An elderly couple called the fire department. He says there's blood everywhere, but no sign of a body. One of the detectives present, Steve Cartwright, who would document his reaction to this in interviews, police records, and a later memoir, Diary in Blue. How did the couple explain it? Asked Cartwright. The other detective shook his head. They couldn't. Lab tech Brenda Dipple, as well as a slew of other officers, were gradually beckoned to go to 1114 Fountain Drive, which was in the Mosley Park neighborhood on that, located about three miles from the downtown area. The dwellings in this neighborhood alternated between folk Victorian cottages and Aspen bungalows that were built on small lots with no driveways. The house to which the police were called mostly blended in with others on that side of town, with a brown brick facade, green shutters, concrete steps leading to a walkway that parted the middle of the front lawn. The neighborhood was working class to its core, where systemic perpetual segregation from better funded white. Detective Cartwright, the AP, whipping out his notepad, sensed an open and shut case. It came down to this. This is, do not bleed. There are no blood vessels or arteries behind walls. Brick and mortar has no heartbeat. If this was blood in the Winston residence, then someone put it there, either via injury, death, or most likely, a simple misunderstanding. How's your eyesight? The detective asked Minnie. It's fine, and I know what I saw. Minnie did not like to be dismissed. 
The former school teacher made it clear she would not be condescended to, a hint the detective took. Willie, who rocked in his chair in their tidy living room, confirmed his wife's descriptions. Had the house been locked? Cartwright stayed. Yes, and the alarm had been set. No one could have gotten inside, and I know what I saw. Minnie repeated, except police officers thought the so-called blood could be anything. Brenda Dipple, however, felt unsettled from the moment she arrived. Usually, a lab tech was an invisible presence at a crime scene, an afterthought to flashier roles carried out by detectives and high-ranking officers. But this time, the young tech could be the key to the whole case. When the unassuming Brenda arrived, the police and all the firemen paused to watch her entrance. Whatever the question was this time, Brenda seemed to be the answer. Brenda went from one space in the dwelling to the next, quietly going about her work. She took close-up photos of the splatter with her specialized camera, the large bulb flashing and momentarily illuminating the blood a bright red, then humming as it cooled down before the next photo. When she prepared to go down into the basement, she paused, a feeling of fear climbing her spine. This house gives me the creeps, she remarked. She got razzed a bit by officers for this grudgingly admitted the liquid did look like blood, began to place a mental wager on it being latex paint. Brenda took the situation very seriously as she descended into the cavernous space below the floor. She was meticulous in all she did. Even on her off time, she was more likely to be found tirelessly tending to a community garden in her black community, providing food for her less fortunate neighbors, and relaxing in front of a television she took her time gathering samples of the fluid that could go to the crime lab to be tested. When Brenda's samples were analyzed, the report came back promptly. It was, in fact, human blood, and it was type O. The Winstons were both type A. Brenda Dippo later achieved her goals of becoming an investigator, serving in that role for the medical examiner's office for years. She remains in Atlanta and uses her expertise to pursue justice as part of a nonprofit devoted to providing investigative services to low-income defendants whose rights the system is, is all too often poised to block. Willie Winston passed away peacefully a little more than two years after the events at the Blood House. Before assembling at the chapel, many and their loved ones reflected privately on his life. Gathering together in the family home at 1114 Fountain Drive, once again a quiet sanctuary from violent injustices raging outside. And we'll see you next time on It's Evil, Real Atlanta Cases. Good night.